Uh, okay, so yes, so glad that we can be here uh, together again, diving into our series on the gifts. And so if you have uh, missed any of our, our, ser- our sermons on the gifts, I encourage you, you can go onto YouTube, you can find Willow Park Church, and you can find our campus there, and you can catch up on anything that you have missed. Uh, also, just a quick plug before we enter in, Empower is happening, uh, not this, up- this weekend, but next weekend, so the weekend after this, uh, a great time to get a bit more deeper into the spiritual gifts. There'll be time to pray. What was that? I'm making a lot of noise. And so uh, a time to pray, a time for us to gather together to learn more about maybe who you are and what Christ has given you. And so um, I encourage you, maybe a group together, go for that weekend. Uh, you know, I talked to some people after service, hey, we should go. Uh, I know Kim will be there Friday night, and so uh, you will see her there. I'm going to switch my mic just because it's just, a, it's just too, too roughly here. All right, there we go. All right, so we are back into the series again on the giftings, and today we're going to be looking at uh, those, we kind of putting them into sections, Uh, we're calling these ones the power gifts, and these these are the ones that maybe can be a bit glamorized, that can be a bit um, controversial, brought down, or questioned, and like everything, sometimes humanity is brought into these type of things, Um, but the heart of the Lord isn't for this to be manufactured. It isn't uh, for these giftings to be put on a pedestal or even profited for uh, or to be glamorized. And that's the problem with culture and sometimes our hearts is that uh, we like the show and uh, we like things that are attractive. And so the whole idea of everything that we're talking about is the point to Jesus. And it's the heart of Christ that it glorifies him and that it isn't made a show. And it's about the people who are experiencing the gift uh, on the other side. And so these gifts, they might make you feel uncomfortable, uncomfortable, uh, but we're going to need to take these gifts back. Uh, the enemy, he wants these gifts to be perverted, abused, because he knows if he can damage them, he can bring division, uh, then that is going to it's going to destroy church. It's going to draw people away from Christ. And so when Christ isn't glorified in the midst of these, this, the blessing is gone. And humility, it always needs to be accompanied with all of these gifts, especially these ones that we're going to talk about as we continue to go forward in this series. Um, And if you remembered last week, we don't want to throw these gifts to the side because when we throw a gift to the side, we actually throw a part of Jesus to the side. We're not experiencing the fullness of Christ if we're not experiencing all these gifts within our body. Um, And so we're going back into 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, 7 to 11, and I'm going to close with the last uh, chapter, or last section in chapter 12. Uh, Then it's going to set up for next week. Chris Ween is going to be speaking next week, and he's going to hit chapter 13. Uh, And then uh, after that, my wife will be speaking from chapter 14 about prophecy and words of wisdom. But here is the text for today. We're heading back in. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit. He distributes them to each one just as he determines. Now, we're looking at two gifts today. We're looking at faith and healing. And we're going to start with faith. Biblically speaking, the word faith just means to trust. And faith, right, it isn't this fairy tale idea uh, to make you feel better. It isn't uh, head in the clouds. I can't see anything happening around me. Uh, faith is actually, a, it's a substance. And so if you're a Christian, you have had a power encounter with faith already, right? right? Ephesians 2.8 says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift from God. So you've recognized Christ as the center of your life and not yourself. You have, you know, confessed your need for him. You have experienced faith. This is salvific faith. Now you are saved and you walk with this life with Christ. And we are told constantly now to have faith as we walk this ongoing faith that we have. And Hebrews eleven six 6 says that. 
And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So accepting Christ, moving forward with Christ, it takes this salvific faith and ongoing faith. And we know that it's impossible to please God without faith. You can't be saved without faith, and you can't be pleasing to God without faith. This is just what we know. But neither salvific faith or ongoing faith are the same as the gift of faith, the spiritual gift of faith. The gift of faith, the spiritual gift of faith, is this supernatural ability to recognize with extraordinary confidence the will or purpose of God in a situation and to trust Him until He brings it to pass. Now, the word used in the Greek is pistis. It's a fun word because okay, so there's pie in it, and so um, we all love pie. Uh, in general, it implies such a knowledge of an assent to and confidence in certain divine truths as produces good works. It's this miraculous faith, faith that is beyond all understanding that, uh, you know what, there's a person in, I've had, do you know that person in life where they just like, they just constantly know the good, constantly know that Christ is working things out for his goodness. Even in the worst situations in their life, they seem to just be happy. This is the gift, the spiritual gift of faith. Now the Holy Spirit distributes this gift to some in the church to encourage and to build up the church in its confidence in God. Those who have the gift of faith trust that God is sovereign and, and he is good The gift of faith seems to be a special ability to trust God in all circumstances. They take him at his word, and they put the full weight of their lives in his hands. They expect God to move and are not surprised when he answers a prayer, performs a miracle. There is this overwhelming trust. Even when things are painful and you experience loss, they still have this sense of like, God's still good. Even in the midst of that. Even when it feels like a delay is happening in their life. They have faith, and the delay doesn't deter them. It's just another, uh, another bump on the journey with Christ as we continue to move forward to his goodness. Often this gift is exercised through prayer. Usually it consists of praying for others. The person with this gift of faith uh, will spend time in prayer, believing that the Lord will do certain things as well as claiming his promises. They know the promises of the Lord, and they're claiming them. They're constantly calling them out. They are just so grounded in the word and so grounded in knowing what he has for them that they're never deterred by whatever comes their way. And the more time they spend in God's word, the more the gifts of faith grows within them. Now, While all believers, as we mentioned before, possess some amount of faith, there is a gift of faith, which is, again, this special ability to trust God beyond the limits of what we even think is normally possible. Not every believer possesses this type of gift. And you might feel bad. You might be like, wow, I'm not a Christian. No, you are a Christian. You know Christ. You love Christ. You follow Christ. But listen, this is the beauty of the whole body, that If you felt like that, you feel down, and you're questioning things, and you're wondering, and somebody with that gift of faith comes along, you're just like, I don't want to talk to that person because they always just like, the Lord is good, the Lord is good. No, we need that person to help build up the body of Christ, right? We all experience fullness of Christ when everybody's operating this gift. I I feel sometimes down, wondering what the Lord's going to do, and then someone comes along with that gift of faith, and they're just building me up, calling those things out. Jeremy, remember the promises? Yeah, I remember them. You're right, I do. And they help build you up. Now, we see the gift of faith throughout the Bible. We see people demonstrate supernatural confidence in God's promises, power, and his presence. Their faith equips people to take this outlandishly heroic stands for the future of God's work in the church. That's why we need people with this gift of faith. They take massive amounts of stands, and they push things forward. Paul, he spoke symbolically of the ability of faith, right, to move mountains. He said in 1 Corinthians 13, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but not, have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can't fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can, that can move mountains, but have not love, I have nothing. The idea is this, is that faith can cause things to happen. That's the idea. Faith can cause things to happen. Faith can cause things to move. The martyr Stephen was a man who was full of faith. The book of Acts says the following about him. It says this. 
And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procherius, and Nacaron, and Timon, and Parmaeus. And I might have just brutally announced all those names, so give me some grace. A proselyte of Antioch. Stephen's faith was such that the Bible singled him out. It recognized him, a man of great faith. Known as a man full of faith. If we know the story of Stephen, right, he's going to end up angering religious leaders, telling them they've crucified the Messiah, and then he's going to be stoned. He's going to be put to death. But that was all because he had faith in the Lord, great faith. And what happened then was the evolution of the early church. It started a great movement after he was stoned. The next example, right, Acts 16. Paul and Silas thrown into jail because they cast a demon, a, a demon out of a girl. And it's common that people who are ever in jail, I'm not sure, I've never been there before. Don't plan on going. Um, but um, I imagine fear is probably something that will grip you if you are in jail. However, instead of being fearful, Paul and Silas, they're singing hymns. They're having a grand old time. You know, this is exactly where I'm meant to be. They had faith that God would rescue them and believe that he had a purpose for them as he does with all Christians. And so while in prison, right, an earthquake, it shook the earth, allowing the occurrence of a jailbreak. However, did they run away? No, they stayed. They stayed in jail. And in doing so, they let a Philippian, or Philippian jailer was, being sa it was saved, along with his entire household. An example of an individual who exercised a gift of faith, a spiritual gift of faith, George Mueller. George Mueller, who lived in the 19th century England, uh, had a great desire to help orphans. He spent his life educating them and building orphanages. By exercising this gift of faith, he was able to raise money time and time again for the needs of the orphans without ever actually appealing to humans. Never made an appeal to humans, but built multiple orphanages just because he had great faith that this is what he was supposed to do and people gave to it. His needs amazingly met. We're going to see that faith and some of these, these giftings that, uh, that we're going to see as we continue forward, they're going to go hand in hand a bit. The successful missionary, William Carey, he said this, Attempt great things for God, expect the great things from God. Those with the gift of faith, they're able to do this. Like, yeah, this is, this is what I believe. This is my motto. It is, you know, it is over my bedstand. And so this is, this is how I live. Now, Signs that you may have this gift. You know, maybe you're hearing this and you're like, I, I, am, I, I am always thinking about the good. I'm a sunny side up kind of guy or lady. Often you're more interested in the future rather than history. History is already played out, but you're looking forward to the future. You're looking for the great things that are going to happen and you're believing for them and you're so excited about them that you want to move things forward. Unmoved by circumstances, suffering, and obstacles, right? You're still things are happening around you. There is that meme, if you ever see, like, you know, there's fire happening all around the person. They're just sitting there having a cup of tea. This is you. And so um, you are, everything is going on around you, but you are just, hey, I'm moved by it. You have a great trust in God, a positive attitude. You're hopeful. You often are visionaries, you're dreamers, you're promoters. You're like, yes, we're moving forward. We want to push these things forward. You're very courageous. You sense the moment when prayer of faith is needed and you want to jump in and you're like, I'm in for this. I'm praying right now. You are goal-centered and you're actively, you remind others of the promises of God. You're actively pushing people and reminding them the Lord has done. The Holy Spirit distributes this gift to some in the church to encourage and to build up the church in its confidence in God. Sometimes believers struggle in faith, right? I mentioned this. We struggle in faith and that isn't if you're struggling with faith, doesn't mean that you, well, when you struggle with faith, we say, don't, don't leave the church. Don't leave. Why? Because if you leave, you're on your own. You're outside of the fullness of Christ. But you're here within the church and you're struggling. You've got questions and you don't know why. People of faith come to you and they help build you up in the midst of everything that you're experiencing and that you're going through. And they call out the promises and they help and they remind you and they build you back up. The enemy, he's like, hey, I question your faith. And then he wants you to leave. He wants you to take that step out because if he knows you take a step out of the body of Christ, he's won. He's won. 
We need these people to help you know, build up the church when we're struggling. People with faith, you might feel like you aren't needed, but you, we need your dreaming. We need you to call out the promises. We need you to remind us. We need you when things feel down, things feel out, and we talk about a post-Christian world, you're saying, no, 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 the Lord is coming again. We need you. Build up, our, build up the faith within the body. They take Christ at his word, and they put the full weight of their lives in his hands. They expect God to move and are not surprised when he answers a prayer or performs a miracle. That's who he is. That's what he does. And that I, what is hindering the gift of faith in our North American culture is our ability to accomplish things on our own and our lack of suffering. And I'm really struck by this as we hear this video today. And I'm thinking about the church, the persecuted church, and what their service looks like. Their service probably looks like they're reading Acts, and it's encouraging them to move forward because they know that Christ is with them. And I'm here trying to theorize faith and healings for you. But we lack suffering. We lack that challenge. Maybe have some cynicism towards it, but these people are so reliant upon it, this is just part of what they expect. Throughout the Bible, we see people demonstrate supernatural confidence in God's promises, his power, and his presence. And their faith equips people to take these heroic stands for the future of God's work in the church. Now, take a deep breath. Take a swig of water because we're going to talk about healing. <laughs> the gift of faith dovetails with the gift of healing. In the Bible, the gift of faith is often accompanied by, or the, yeah, is accompanied, accompanied by great works of faith. In Acts 3, 1 to 10, we see this gift in action when Peter sees a lame man at the beautiful gate, and he calls on him to stand up and walk in the name of Jesus. They're going hand in hand, faith and healing. Now, here we go. The gift of healing. Let's buckle up. I want to trend this gift with grace. With a grace. Our bodies, right, they have the natural ability to get over sickness. And obviously we have doctors who help in this space. Uh, and they've been given beautiful knowledge on how the body works. We recognize this. Doesn't mean you lack faith if you go to a doctor. But this is a supernatural ability of healing to show the power of Christ that we're talking about today. I think we all have prayed for this gift to be relevant in a situation in our life. And I think we've all seen things maybe not come to fruition. And while knowing or hearing is happened for some. When healing doesn't happen, we then want to discredit this aspect and not want to venture towards this gift because of one, pain. And because of two, we live in a world where we tell intelligence and we can't wrap our intelligence around this when something doesn't happen. We cannot run from this anymore because of the way it maybe has been mistreated in the past or our feelings towards it. And again, we mentioned, I mentioned earlier, if you've been saved, you have had a power encounter with healing already, right? Our biggest and most important thing is that we were lost, separated from Christ, that we were broken, and he has come We've experienced this beautiful healing in a relationship with Christ. And one day again, we'll be with him for eternity. But if we're going to come under the Bible and Jesus as authoritative, it's not just our theological constru constructs that have to come under that authority, but it's the life of the Spirit too. We cannot have one without the other. We cannot have theology without the life in the Spirit. Because if we just have theology, that would just make us Pharisees. If the only authority you want from Scripture is the word stuff, so you can live life however you want, but to have, you know, great theology up here, that makes you a Pharisee. We are called to live a life in Jesus' spirit. And these are things that make us want to, that take control out of our hands. Something that we can't theologically theorize sometimes. Now, healing, here we go, is the special ability that God gives to certain members of the body of Christ to serve as human intermediaries through whom it pleases God to cure illness and restore health apart from the use of natural means. Now, those with this gift are instruments of God's healing power, 
restoring physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being through prayer and faith. We cannot overlook the part of spiritual, right, and emotional healing too. When someone gets saved, and again, mention this, that's spiritual healing. What was broken and lost is restored. Now emotional, if you have the ability to help administer the truth of Christ, you know, into people's emotional pain from relationships and experience, that, that's actually the gift of healing too. Uh, there is this lady who leads a group mentorship uh, time that I am in. She was sexually abused, right? Emotionally pained because of it. Uh, and it was the counsel by a person through the Holy Spirit that helped bring her healing. This person was gifted to heal. Everything she did was to point Christ uh, and powered through Christ. And there's many examples in Scripture. Jesus and the adulterer, right? G the adulterer, she's put on display in front of everybody, the whole crowd. Now, tell me, would you like to have your shortcomings put on display in front of everybody? And if you've had, what, just, what pain was there? More emotional pain, never physical pain, but emotional pain. And Jesus defends and he quiets the Pharisees, tells her to sin no more, and she goes on, changed, it says. There was no sickness in her life, just emotional pain. Jesus and the prostitute, prostitute, obviously a very public thing that she is a prostitute. But Jesus defends the prostitute, tells her to go on and sin no more. She's changed. And all the emotional pain that she's experienced is now gone. Now, individuals with the gift of healing exhibit a deep sense of compassion for the suffering and strong belief in God's ability to bring forth restoration and wholeness. They pray for the sick and brokenhearted, trusting in God's divine inter intervention. This gift used in the local church can encourage faith and hope. Healing can often spark revival and repentance. God often used this as a sign gift to the Jews, both in the Old and New Testament. The gift encourages those new in the faith, and healing ultimately leads to God's glory. That's all it's meant to do. Lead to God's glory. Point people to Jesus. Glorify Christ. Charismata Aymaton is literally translated gifts of healing. And again, this spiritual gift is closely related, faith and miracles. All spiritual gifts are to be exercised in faith, but gifts of healing evolve this special measure of it. Now, this gift is interesting in that there is no guarantee that a person will always be able to heal anyone he or she desires. It is subject, just, it's subject to Christ, it's subject to God, as all the spiritual gifts are. They all are subject. They're all led by him. They are all of his spirit leading us. So the gift of healing is when the Holy Spirit heals someone from a disease, an infirmity, supernaturally. We see this in the Gospels, in the book of Acts, when Jesus' followers heal people through prayer, anointing with oil, or the power of their words, right? Peter and John tell a lame beggar outside the temple to get up and walk, and he does. Philip preaches the gospel in Samaria, and he heals many who were paralyzed or lame. Peter tells a paralyzed man named Aeneas, or Aeneas to get out of bed and walk, and he does. Peter also prays for a woman named Dorcas, and she comes back to life. That same Holy Spirit that worked through Peter, John, Paul, and all disciples, it lives in us, and it lives and it works in us. It is meant to show us that what is happening after Acts and into the New Testament writings is actually still happening with this, us today. Now, where there might be pain in the conversation of healing is from what maybe we see in James 5, 13 to 15. It says this, Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint, and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And in the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Now, some Christians really quote this when they say that we can all learn to heal. That any Christian through prayer and faith can heal physical or mental illness. He says the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. This can be misused to support when healing doesn't actually seem to happen. This is misused when, you know, we maybe see healing not happen when someone's prayed for. 
the implication that some people use is that the suffering Christian just didn't quite believe enough or is hiding some sort of sin. See, their misunderstanding about faith healing has destroyed some believers when they say that. If that's what you've experienced in the past, someone saying you didn't have enough faith, let me tell you that is not the heart of Christ. That is not the heart of Christ. My prayer right now is that the healing power of Christ comes into that emotional pain that you've experienced. When someone says that to the person who is sick, that you didn't have enough faith, what they're essentially saying and doing is transferring the healing power onto the sick. And this breaks Christ's heart. And if I am correct in scripture, we couldn't fix ourselves. Christ had to come. He had to come for us. We didn't have enough faith to make it work. It was Jesus who had to come to do the work. The whole thing with Christ is that we can't heal ourselves. That is why he came. The spiritual gift of healing doesn't apply pressure to the sick person at all. It doesn't apply pressure for them to feel something that isn't there either. My brother-in-law, we talked, for those who know us, he's had kidney failure. He's had it since they've been married, and they've been married for 16 years, um, uh, Justin and Cheryl, and Cheryl being my wife's uh, sister. At one point, he was told by the church that we have done all that we can for you. We have prayed for you, and obviously there's something in your life, or there's something that you have, don't have enough faith. We're actually done praying for you to be healed. This affected him for quite a bit in his life. This crushed his faith. It took him on a journey. It drew him away from Christ. A dark journey that was, had ups and downs and almost led to separation from him and his wife and a broken family. But now he's back walking closely with Christ. Still not healed by what we think, but always willing to be prayed for. Someone's like, feel that they should pray for him to be healed? He's like, yes, please pray for me. But now it doesn't crush him. It's not on him. He's walking with Christ. He's trusting in the Lord. The spiritual gift of healing is real, but that isn't the way it's meant to be exercised. James encourages believers to try every method of healing um, God has laid before them, but healing always comes from Christ, always from him. He offers an invitation to dive deeply into faith with honesty and submission. That's what James is about. Let's dive deeply into this with honesty and submission. Let's be honest about where we are, trusting that whatever the outcome, God's plans, he's still there. He's still good. He's still perfect. He's still leading. We cannot decide healing, but we believe for healing. And we need to believe for healing. We might say, well, Paul and Timothy, right? They were healing machines, right? There's all, all the book is about them healing. But there are moments in scripture where healing doesn't seem to happen in their presence. A, nam, a man named Trophimus, listen, they are giving me, I got some hard words today. And so I'm trying my best. Was left behind while Paul but was left behind by Paul while he was still sick. In 2 Timothy 4.20, it said, Erastus stayed at Corinth. Trophimus was sick when I left him at Miletus. Didn't say, Paul didn't say, you know, he was sick, but I healed him. In another instance, Timothy was not told to visit a person with the gift of healing, but rather to take wine for his physical infirmities. He says in 1 Timothy 5, 23, stop drinking only water, take a little wine to help your stomach trouble and the other illnesses you always have. So obviously this person always has something. Timothy's giving them some recommendations. We can't control or conjure up the gift of healing. The Holy Spirit might give someone the ability to heal one situation, but that doesn't mean that person can heal at will or that everyone he or she prays for will be healed. Imagine they feel like they had that kind of power. This gift is very much led by the Spirit. The person with the gift to heal cannot can heal or can heal on command, but has the faith in the history to heal. They just have that faith, the history that they have. And you know what? They pray and they trust. The Spirit seems to use them for this, this gift of healing. 
One person does not have a monopoly on every sort of healing. At times, a person with at times, a person with gifts to heal will not be able to heal, and we may not understand why. For example, why just Dorcas was raised from the dead, not anybody else? We didn't get, don't get a detailed explanation of the Spirit's motives, but we do see an obedient servant in Peter and a burst of revival in the church as a result. So this is another good way to know if someone is responding to the Holy Spirit. His gifts, including healing, are meant to build up the church, not the person exercising the gift. And when people tried to worship Paul for healing a lame man, he quickly redirected their awe, saying, friends, like, why are you doing this? Let's not sell, like, this isn't on me. So we are two are only human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from those worthless things to the living God. And so my hope is that we do not put praying for healings into a box or the gift of healing into a box and push it to the side because again we're pushing a piece of Jesus to the side we're not experiencing the fullness of him my hope is to encourage the church that this gift is for us today and what our world needs to experience in a post-christian world we need to experience this type of power as I mentioned we are to continue to pray for healing and it's healing doesn't happen we continue to push in and we pray and not blame anyone's faith. We continue to trust and believe and step out. Listen, theology and convincing academically isn't the way everyone is meant to come to Christ. That's not the whole way. We might think our world is so smart right now, but I question actually if our world is so smart right now. Our world needs to see the gift of power revealed so they can come to Christ. We cannot deny that this gift is for the church. Now, you might feel stirred up. You might feel, I, I have prayed for somebody before. I've seen him. But, you know, I didn't want to say anything. Because I prayed sometimes and nothing's happened. But you might feel like you have this gift. If you enjoy and sense the need to pray for the healing of the sick, you just feel like someone's sick and you've got to pray. Has great faith that God can heal apart from natural means has compassion on others who are sick or suffering and is willing to take them time in ministering healing to them, has experienced ma miraculous healing maybe in your own body, understands that Jesus is the healer and hence faith is directed away from self. Jesus, he had this gift. The authority, it says, was upon him. So he can demand. He could say, be healed. The authority was upon him. I don't have this gift. So I pray for healing. Lord, heal. And I ask, Lord, let your will be done. But if you have this gift, you sense to pray with authority a bit. You're like, Lord, I believe in, in your calling. And you're, you're saying, Lord, have your way. Lord, do this. If you feel like you have this gift, remember that your first pursuit and only pursuit is Jesus, not the gift. Now, I'm going to close with this. The last section in chapter 12, which will help set up next week for Chris as he enters into 1 Corinthians 13. It says this. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honorable we treat with special honor, and the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while other presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, and that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part is rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. All are apostles. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. It's like Paul purposely stops after sharing all those gifts, then reminds them, this is all what this is all about. And then he goes into it, that this is all about unity. I come, he, me, I come as a messenger of one who doesn't always understand when and how these giftings are meant to happen. But I come with the excitement, sharing that these gifts are still meant to be active and alive in our church today. Why? Paul reminds us that we will all work 
together, that we will all work together, that these giftings help us embrace unity in the body. Everyone brings, bringing forth something that shows the fullness of Christ. No one is greater than from the other. We all need each other to fully function in the gift given to us. There is a beauty and power and unity. And Chris will share about that all of these giftings that we've been given, that we've been talking about so far, they mean absolutely nothing if they're wrapped up without, if they're not wrapped in love. And there is a section that I just want to touch, that first section that I actually don't hear people talk about a lot. And Paul is telling us what the body is actually doing to each other in this section. He's saying this is what you're doing to each other in this section. He's doing the metaphor of the body. And he's being almost a little bit sly in the way he's saying it. He says, on the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Think of it as like a sarcastic voice that Paul is using. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable, we are, are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. Paul, he's talking about the human body and how we treat certain parts of this Christian body. And there is a section where he says the parts that are un presentable are treated with special modesty. Uh, Josh, I'll invite you to come on up. You can play in a worship team. There is a section where he says, and the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. Now, think of the body. This is the part of the body that makes us male and female. Right? Obviously, we cover this part up. But when Paul is speaking metaphorically about the gifts, he is telling the readers that we do not need to cover up this gift. Now, he's not saying it's David Sunday and we're dancing that way, you know? And so he's saying spiritually, we can't be covering these things up anymore. He's like, we can't be covering up these gifts. We can't be covering up healing. We can't be covering up prophecy. We can't be covering up uh, gifts of mercy. We can't be covering these things up. I feel like that is what's happened in our church culture recently. Gifts are being covered up. We want to hide them. We want to keep them hidden. Maybe because we're ashamed of them a little bit, because maybe some of the history of healing a little bit, we're a little bit ashamed, so we want to cover it up. Because yes, some people have abused this ministry. It's super unfortunate. And they've hurt people because of it. But Christ is saying we cannot cover these up anymore. Listen, we've covered them up, these giftings, and now we see what our culture is like because we've covered some of these giftings up. We've covered some of them up. I feel like the other parts of the body want to cover up the gift of healing because we might be ashamed of it a little bit. Let's stand together. We're going to take communion. And this communion that we take, it reminds us of the ultimate healing that we have. But it also reminds us of this, that Christ came to bring unity. And that when we are all working together as the body of Christ in the beautiful way that he's created each of us individually and we're bringing our giftings to the table and we, you know, I have a gift that we feel like, oh, I'm not too sure how people are going to react about this because of what's happened in the past. Listen, Christ, we want to move forward pointing to Christ and we wanted this gifting to come out. We want to not be afraid to pray when healing needs to come. But the beautiful reminder is this, is that communion reminds us of the ultimate healing that we have received through Christ. The greatest gift we've ever needed, we've already experienced. He wants to give us pieces of that end result that we say we'll be fully restored now. He's saying we have an opportunity to bring heaven to earth, but we can only do that if we operate fullness of who we are as a body of Christ.